This is Duke University. Our fourth speaker is uh, Petra Gelbert, a Romani musician, activist, and scholar, a Harvard ethnomusicology PhD, and she's the co-founder of the Initiative for Romani Music at New York University and has been on the faculty of the State University of New York um, at Purchase. Uh, she has published in both English and Czech, and after years of intermittent work with Romani and other children in schools and state care, she is pursuing a master's in music therapy, and the title of her talk today is Music as Therapy, Music as Ghetto, Practical Implications of Romani Representation. Please. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having me, Angela. I'm really excited to be here. After um, these uh, presentations that we just had, I'm thinking I should just tap dance. Um, a chunk of my paper is, is a pretty um, weird and oversimplified version of uh, some of the things Carol was saying, but uh, just bear with me. So, um, in the humanities, as well as in performing arts industries, there are many ways to categorize music by purported origin, by style, by how skimpy the singer's outfit is, and so on. Academics feel the need to theorize the arts while cleaving to or subverting disciplinary boundaries. I am an ethnomusicologist and gajologist who defected to become a music therapist, so naturally I am recategorizing everything. One established and fruitful approach to theorizing music is by function. As my attention has turned to the psychodynamic uses as well as the deeper symbolism of musical products and processes, I am seeing three ways to describe the various musics associated with Romani people. One, as entertainment or ritual. Two, as therapy for Romanis. And three, as therapy for non-Roma. This last function normally necessitates the deployment of powerful stereotypes that are largely divorced from Romani realities. The first category, music as entertainment and ritual, needs little elaboration. We have more or less uniquely Romani styles, many hybrid musics, and also genres such as gypsy swing or Romani hip hop that borrow heavily from other cultures. We have parties, CDs, MP3 players, concerts, and weddings. We play in other people's MP3 players and weddings. Romani groups have circumcisions, baptisms, pilgrimages, syncretic spiritual traditions, and religious institutions such as God's Gypsy Christian Church, with its congregations and radio programs in America. There are, of course, spaces wherein ritual, entertainment, and therapeutic functions of music intersect. Besides those Romani communities in which songs are used for interpersonal communication and conflict resolution, one could argue, as countless authors have, that religious and other contexts for music can provide healing, management of intrapsychic or relational stress, and other biopsychosocial benefits. The categories of therapy that I am exploring are not necessarily tied to particular spaces or occasions. Their functions are instead contingent upon culturally encoded archetypes and interethnic dynamics. Therapy ameliorates something that is wrong or missing, and to achieve its goal, it draws on forces outside the individual. Western music therapy as a profession and research discipline is very specifically defined in accordance with clinical settings and it requires one or more academic degrees, as I found out. <laughs> in contrast, today I am using the term therapy in a loose sense, but one that is nevertheless related to the alleviation of symptoms such as feelings of deracination, low self-concept, ennui, or rage stemming from humiliation. So many things. For Romanese, music and dance facilitate physical and psychological well-being, much like in other cultures, that place a high value on socially participatory performance. Within subaltern groups, however, in-group musics and inter-ethnic artistic alliances take on added meanings, which are frequently theorized by musicologists in terms of resistance and solidarity. From the standpoint of therapy, one could speak of ego strength, which is a mental health concept closely related to resilience. Among Roma, Gitanos, and other cultures collectively known as gypsies, there is often a possessive investment in the uniqueness or superiority of in-group artistry and self-expression. And here I'm really just you know, talking about the same things that uh, Kel Silverman and, and others um, have articulated. Arguments about ethnically coded authenticity in flamenco are a prime example. And honestly, you can kind of see why <laughs> in flamenco. 
the designation of gypsies as, valu as valued music and dance specialists is commonly the only recognition of anything resembling full humanity that this minority is afforded by non-Roma. It is no wonder then that Romani performers and consumers will self-essentialize, mirroring the majority group's unscientific ethno-theories of music in the blood. As humans, we have a drive toward enacting and articulating our utility, and Romanis are no exception. This drive is elucidated in developmental psychology with frameworks such as Erickson's generativity stage or Maslow's concept of self-actualization. As the demand for Romani craftsmanship and most niche services comes to an end, music and dance created by Romanis on the world stage remain virtually the sole vessels for a representation of our collective utility. I'm not saying it should be that way. Um, just saying it kind of is. Celebrating Romani artistic contributions is thus crucial to many group members' development of an acceptable self-image or the salvaging thereof, however double-edged the associated stereotypes may be. Historically, Romani mus professional musicians have enjoyed a higher socioeconomic status than their counterparts in other professions and or the underclass. Other Romanis, too, benefit intrapersonally and interpersonally by associating with a proud artistic heritage that has at times crossed over to elite non-Romani circles. Hungarian Romani orchestras and Russian Romani choirs are two examples. Um, and I did want to show you, I'm not sure how easily this is going to happen, so maybe I'll just wait with the examples to the end. <laughs> I just have a, um, three little videos. Um, but I need it uh, from six, six, or six and a half, six thirty. So this is um, Moreno Rakep. He's a Sinti composer. I don't know if, if you all have heard of the Auschwitz Requiem. So this is a performance of the Auschwitz Requiem. <laughs> the performing arts are a point of pride for Romani communities, they potentially constitute a psychological lifeline for individuals who are unable to draw on strength in numbers. As my dissertation showed, in school settings, Roma often find a hostile social environment, so the inclusion of their music can facilitate integration, but also pose problems of conflict and misrepresentation. I experienced a poignant version of these tendencies while volunteering in two Slovak orphanages that housed overwhelmingly Romani children. The staff often behaved in criminal ways that chipped away at the children's sense of their own humanity. I witnessed gross medical neglect, emotional abuse, and hunger. Some children had stereotypies, such as perseverative rocking, that are symptomatic of long-term denials of developmentally necessary social connections. All of the children, regardless of their intellectual abilities or ambitions, were educated in facilities for those with mental retardation. I'm sure many of you are not surprised by that. Corroborating each other's stories, some spoke about sexual abuse and steady strings of racial slurs from staff members. I, too, was left with no doubt as to how certain caretakers felt about gypsies. When I brought live Romani music to the orphanage, the quality left much to be desired because, as an acquaintance one told, once told me, I play guitar like a gaji. But don't worry, I have Romani singing in my blood. That's for tomorrow, it's important. Um, for the children, however, I represented a bridge between the Romani world, to which they belonged by virtue of skin color or at least origin, and their current world, a sort of prison, or if you'd like, panopticon, in which Romani culture was consistently denigrated. Although some of the staff looked absolutely dyspeptic as I worked with their charges, I was the responsible adult in those moments, and I was Romani, and I had the cachet of a successful life in America, and I said that this music and dance are worthy of study. I also appeared to know non-Roma who agreed. This was a powerful message in relation to self-concept formation. 
My psychologist friend Martina Vanchakova and I have shared that message with foster families across the Czech Republic in workshops and summer camps that have spanned a decade. Our goal has always been to promote healthy identity development in Romani children raised by non-Roma. In order for this to occur, and for a family's identity as a whole to shift toward a culturally integrated state, the foster or adoptive parents must participate actively in Romani language singing and other family experiences, as well as in separate explorations of their own racial biases and their complex feelings surrounding birth families. And I use music in these discussions too. School-age children almost invariably come to us with some level of identity-related trauma due to racially charged comments and actions on the part of peers and, not infrequently, educators or other professionals. Arts-based experiences can instill and mobilize a set of inner resources to counter this trauma. The therapeutic aspect of our work stems from the construction of an embodied narrative in which heritage and culturally specific coping mechanisms are encoded through music making, dance, and other modalities. We have drawn on Martina's published model of identity and attachment development for transracially fostered or adopted children, as well as on my research and experience in cross-cultural communication. One outcome of that research is that music and dance are never enough. In fact, a sole emphasis on the performing arts can be harmful in educational and therapeutic settings that involve either Roma or people whose understanding of Romanese we are trying to increase. I will outline some reasons for this in the following section as I suggest some further therapeutic uses of Romani music. Gypsy tribal belly dancing and hypersexualized or just plain ludicrous Halloween costumes are two examples of projections employed by individuals who are seeking escape, sexual self-expression, emotional release, or communion with forces outside of themselves, such as a vague spirituality, a sense of freedom, or the proverbial connection to the earth. From a psychoanalytical standpoint, imagined attributes of gypsies, American Indians, Hindus, and other groups function as transitional objects. We can think of cultural transitional objects or parts of collective transitional, transitional objects with reference to various authors. Taking a term from Sherry and Kozinets, individuals who engage in these projections act as cultural transvestites. In my view, consumers project their inner quests for meaning and for emotional integration onto exoticized others who happen to be more mythical than real. This is due to ignorance on the part of dominant agents, hence the New York Times, along with everyone and their cousin, defining gypsies as a nomadic ethnicity. Vandenport finds specific social knowledge in the projection of people's concerns about their own identity and civilization onto gypsies. In the case of Serbs, he observed that non-Roma are socialized at a young age to consider gypsy as a part of themselves to be repressed. I believe this applies elsewhere in Europe as well, and in large part this dynamic defines relations between Romani musicians and majority groups. By contrast, Americans are mainly unfamiliar with Romanis as an ethnic group, although gypsy stereotypes have made their way into the nation's psyche. Thus, Americans project aspects of themselves onto an almost entirely mythologized gypsiness. I call this the gypsy and me phenomenon. In the context of real or fictional gypsy music, people seeking relief from their mundane existence can begin to feel free or truly understood or connected to their primal being and so on. For example, in two separate case studies of a formalized therapy known as guided imagery and music, one client wished to join a gypsy caravan, and another had a gypsy violinist become part of her visualized healing ceremony. Meanwhile, as we know, actual Romanis continue to be constrained by perceptions of gypsies as problematic and strange. Their freedom may also be severely restricted by a subgroup's strict laws where this is applicable. For some families, this means enacting ritual purity codes, social norms, territorially informed identities, and so on in endless irony. Not infrequently, music made by Romanis is characterized as wild, passionate, genetically hot-tempered, instinctual, or primitive. It is difficult to extricate the music from some of these indexed associations on a symbolic level. In North America and parts of Western Europe, Romani music and musicians are misunderstood as nomadic. 
In other places, the music is increasingly seen as belonging to the ghetto, an element that threatens all of society. Moreover, I'm not saying it does, I'm just saying that people think that, just to be clear. Okay. Moreover, cliched descriptions leave little room for actual analysis, i.e. for the technical and intellect-based aspects of Romani music, or for music that is emotionally measured, rather than dripping with urgent self-expression. Um, and here I just comparing two sisters who are both Romani musicians and one is marketed as such and the other one isn't. Um, and the one who is is Ida Kelarova, who in addition to her stage career is for all intents and purposes an uncredentialed music therapist who treats non-Romani persons with a mix of established experiential techniques such as guided breathing and the richly harmonized group singing as well as verbal processing of Romani songs. Her workshops are a sort of compromise between generic fantasy-based projections of psychological phenomena onto gypsiness and a space in which she, as a respected professional, deploys Romani realities slash stereotypes to meet her clients' needs. The therapeutic work happens not only through the various projective associations I have discussed, but also through the emotion-eliciting power of sophisticated song arrangements, as well as the enormous range of affect expressed through Ida's voice. If we had time, I'd show you, but I guess we don't. Um, but whereas members of dominant groups can be primal, natural, and freely moving with no stigma, especially within the safety of their exoticist forays, Roma are frequently compared to animals. And I think this is a really important uh, thing to realize, especially within the safe, um, either directly or through the use of racially coded language, like tsikanyata in Czech, and metaphor. The promotion of Romani music can reify mind-body binaries, implicating Romanis as less civilized or unintellectual, precisely because they are seen as highly successful at natural musicking and unbridled self-expression. So, and this is a conclusion. Our use of performing arts styles labeled as Romani should thus be semiotically flexible, critically analyzed, and I did say freed from essentialism, but after <laughs> listening to Carol Silverman, I'm going to have to seriously revise that. But you know what I mean. <laughs> the effects of the stereotyping and self-stereotyping of Romani musicians can be tempered by a much greater focus on visual arts, <laughs> literature, and philosophy, as well as by diverse presentations of Romani economic or social activity. We make great music but we do not have to be defined by what that music represents to the outside world without our fully informed consent. <laughs>